Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, where it's our goal to help you become the best financial advisor possible and drive the positive evolution of financial advice. Hub24 is an ASX-listed company with over $15 billion funds under management and one of the fastest-growing platforms in the market. Neither a bank nor part of a bank, Hub24 focuses entirely on connecting advisors to a broad range of investment solutions for their clients. Discover why other advisors think Hub24 are the best in the market and access the benefits of choice and efficiency for you and your clients with their market-leaning managed portfolio solution. To find out more, visit hub24.com.au. G'day, g'day. How's it going? What do you know? Strike a light. Clayton here from XY Advisor and I'm pretty stoked to finally get to have this chat because uh, Ben is sort of like a very interesting person that's influential advice but you're tucked away so far away up the coast that uh, you're probably not as well known as, as you should be mate but um, so as background myself and Ben we got to know each other at the uh, AMP Horizons Academy, um, got o- almost a decade ago at this stage, yeah, yeah. and um, and <clears throat> still to this day, as the one of the funniest things I ever saw was when because you were sort of young back then, and you, and you stood up and you're like, "Yeah, I'm definitely going to succeed at this because I've already decided that I'm going to succeed at this." And I was like, "I love that. <laughs> I love that. Just so yeah, confident." Just- just for the viewers there, I don't want them starting and thinking that I'm a cocky little shit. <laughs> uh, I think there's a big difference between confident and cockiness. Uh, the person that you're referring to there had neither. Um, I, I think the argument was with that is that everybody that we were in that room with was a solicitor or a lawyer or an accountant or whatever. Um, yeah. And my argument was, I can't not succeed at this because I've got nothing to fall back on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was a kickboxer. So, you know, like it, it had yeah. to work. Yeah. <laughs> I and just then, didn't think I phrased it the best though because it did come off a bit <laughs> obnoxious. Mate, it was, I loved it. I absolutely loved mm. it. And, um, and look, let's face it, you, you did go on to prove yourself right. Um, and, and it's been awesome to watch, man. So... You, uh, after, after doing um, the AMP Horizon stuff, you then shot up to Queensland um, and then you ended up in Bundaberg, which is where you've grown your practice uh, over the last, I guess, about seven or eight years. Yeah, is that a pretty accurate description? Yeah, mate. The, the way that it was sort of sold to me was um, we got a bunch of books in the rural area. We think you'd get on well with the rural people because of the way you speak and your background. Um, you've got Cairns, Hubby Bay or Bundaberg. Hubby Bay is kind of known as a bit of a retiree central. Cairns is a bit of a party place, so it's just a bit too far. Yeah. Um, and Bundaberg was this little niche kind of place that nobody had really heard about and which proved to be incredibly wrong. I did a little <laughs> bit of Googling um, and found the ratio of people to advisors in Bundaberg was the lowest of the three options. Yeah, right. Um, but then I think when I moved here, I figured out that a lot, not a lot of them were on Google and it actually became the highest. <laughs> that was a bit of fun. <laughs> That's hilarious. And how, so how big is the population in Bundaberg? I, mean, I think we had about 120,000, give or take. So it's not... Actually, that's substantially bigger than I was anticipating. I thought I thought um, I thought it would be closer to say like twenty or thirty thousand. Oh no, she's fairly big. And when they say Bundaberg, they mean the surrounding areas. And yeah, we're yeah. quite lucky up here. We might have one bloke for every hundred thousand acres. So yeah, <laughs> that's crazy. But I think a couple of years ago there was forty six advisors, and now there's about thirty five, soon to be twenty three. So it's kind of just yeah, right. We're in quite an interesting position here. Um, and we're quite looking forward to seeing what happens in the next few years. Mm. Well, I mean, put it this way. Um, from what I can tell in the UK, before they kicked off their version of let's call it the Royal Commission, uh, or actually it's more accurately, let's call it Phasia, before they kicked off that in 2012, um, there was about 50,000 advisors, do or take, and after their first year came in in 2012, and you saw quite a steep decline down to 25,000. 
and uh, and now it's it's growing again um, in a healthy fashion. But there's been some really weird changes. Like so, for example, a lot of it is highly vertically integrated because of the costs and expenses involved in being what we would call licensed. Um, and that's kind of, you know, I'm not seeing that exactly reflected in the Australian market and hopefully it doesn't end up uh, like that because I think one of the, the benefits is, is um, the ability to be self-licensed or to, to, to have, you know, co-ops of, of smaller groups of advisors. So hopefully we, we keep that diversification alive, but certainly the, dr- the drop in advisors is well underway. You know, we've gone from 25,000 down to 20,000 even in the last year. And, you know, that will undoubtedly go down to, at, I would say probably 15 over the next couple of years. Um, because of how strange it is, like advice is changing in real time. And, uh, and that's just very difficult, you know, it, for any profession is, is, is to go through, you know, changes as they're happening um, and to keep up to date and stay on top of it and to avoid the pitfalls and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, man, like I have no doubt that Bundaberg is going to um, lose a few more advisors. Sure. Mate, you flipped that coin as well. And, and just for the, the viewers, I'm a bit of a academic statistical nerd um, and I don't see why the lovely people that we deal with on a day-to-day basis should be subject to incredible fee rises purely because of a bunch of things that have happened that aren't necessarily their fault. And so I've done a bit of sort of pre-work and used all the cost of service calculated you could possibly imagine and sort of come to the conclusion in theory, it should be like sort of double or triple what we are charging at the moment. And then I'm also not really confident even considering having those conversations with people because I don't think it's their fault. So what we're, and sort of a bit of a caveat for this, um, a couple of years ago, I heard Roxy on the podcast say something like he had made provisions for things that ASIC hadn't yet introduced Mm. um, on the basis that he thinks they might be introduced. So what we started doing a couple of years, or sorry, probably 18 months ago, was, was seeking ways to find advice faster, more efficient, um, changing the way in which it was delivered and how it was validated and how we signed off. And then just sort of, we we sort of toyed with the concept and people said, nah, and then we changed the idea of it and said, no, you will do this um, because it's the way of the future. And now we're sort of designing loom videos and whatnot, similar to the ones that I showed you the other day about how to do it. You know, because it's this big bugaboo of I've got all these extra forms to give to this client who doesn't care. Um, and how do I do this faster in order to keep our sustainability? How do we change the notion of profit? Otherwise, very similar to what you were saying, I worry about if we pack up shop, we being advisors as a general, and advisors cease to exist, what happens to these clients that we go to bat for day in, day out? I mean, I mean, it's a very sort of relevant argument that you've come across before, but it's a sort of systemic issue which we need to address yesterday, not, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, and that was actually, <laughs> there's different ways to approach, I guess, the changes that are coming. And one of the things and one of the reasons why I wanted to have this podcast with you is because the, one option is to bail, right? One option is to fight. Uh, one option is to increase fees. And one option is to increase efficiencies um, so that you can uh, do a larger amount of work, even if the margin is slightly smaller, um, thereby technically increasing your margin um, through efficiency. So you've chosen the latter of those four. And considering, I mean, a a lot of advisors are city-based, right? And you, you would be far more rural based than most advisors and yet even though your clients are farmers and and whatnot you're still uh have you you still have been able to redesign your offering so that uh, it's an easier way to do administration yes and like without sort of you know having to go through the, the the video that i watched what was your thinking behind achieving this? And then how did you do it? 
So Simon Snack sort of says start with the why. And the why, which was identified when I was doing the Masters, was advice is too slow. If you think about our generation, like Vera's out now working, so are you, you're doing this. My partner, Joe, we're, we're doing this. If I'm going to try and get an advisor to lock us down for, say, an hour or a half now, oh, like just as a bit of a caveat, Joe runs um, the elective surgery department at the Bundaberg base. So Jesus, her day is stupid. Yeah. Some doctor who's like, I don't want to work today. Can you cancel tomorrow's list? And she goes, sorry, what? <laughs> Blokes right, come yeah. in from Longreach or whatever. It's taken them 12 hours. And he goes, sorry, mate. Doctor doesn't feel like it tomorrow. Oh. So it's, it's, a, it's just, and then if you think after all that, which happens day in, day out, how are we supposed to sit down and don't get me wrong, I'm just going to caveat the rest of this podcast with due consideration is given to professionalism and all that sort of jazz. So I'm not saying you're not worth a lot. I'm just saying that in the scheme of things, we don't want to sacrifice an hour of our very, very, very time poor lives in order to sit with someone if it's not entirely relevant. Initials, absolutely. Do I want to see my solicitor every time to run through a stupid contract, which I can run over online? No, email it to me. I'm busy. Mm-hmm. So how, how do we change advice? And it became really bad during the Royal Commission, you know, that some of the big licensees were taking 45 days to get an SOA. I had a, a late a coffee with a, a bird from ANZ this morning. She reckons it's two months. Oh. How is that relevant? How, how does, what do you, I would have forgotten. I would have forgotten. <laughs> exactly. I have to myself. Clayton, is it? <laughs> that's right, I spoke to you, didn't we? Yeah. Oh, oh, that's so brutal. And also they put these caveats on, you know, uh, balances are got to be within, say, 14 days. Cool. Uh, advice has got to be delivered within, say, 14 or 30 days. Excellent. Done. Oh, if you don't do that, you've got to go back to power planning and re-establish everything to make sure modelling's right, which, again, clients don't care about. Um, and then, Lord forbid, they have a holiday or the case that we had yesterday gave this bloke an SOA, then he had a heart attack and a stroke, and while they were in there, they found out he had cancer. So naturally, he's not going to make that time frame. Luckily, he's okay, but he came in yesterday, and it was, and we're sort of saying, this isn't relevant. Like, how do we give it faster? So as a bit of a nutshell, what we've done now is just leaning towards absolute digital signatures. So we, we set up our platform plus, which I'm happy to share with absolutely anyone. We've got a a portal, so you go to our website, you get, you know, Clayton, Daniel, and password, whatever, and in there it has every document you've ever signed, every document we've got on your behalf. We can share file notes, which you can acknowledge, Um, and the idea of that was just to increase the heck out of the efficiency. So whatever we're writing, you can see. Um, Then it takes under, as per that video, two minutes to create now uh, a letter of initial engagement, which has got the fee on it. And then what we do is upload this to the portal, which takes all of 30 seconds. And we issue, we say, hey, mate, this is, your, this is what we agreed to. This is what's going on. When you're happy with it, no rush, hit this button. It'll release a pin to your mobile. And then so you get step one, authentication. And then you log on, step two, and you put the pin in. And it will tell me who signed it, where the pin was sent to. So it has to obviously be your mobile number. And then, like, you can't tell me from a compliant point of view that that's not bloody golden because there's Mm. two steps to get in there. And then so what we're doing is just screaming back. We've done templates for absolutely everything. We get it not challenging. ASIC don't want to see cookie cutting. We're just saying all of the content that Fascia wants is there. So you just go through and delete what is and isn't relevant. And I've encapsulated everything. You name it, it's in there. Test trust, direct equities. You name it, she's there. So you simply just go through and delete what's not relevant and you can lodge that as well. And if you need to, hey, Clay, here's the notes from the meeting. Acknowledge them. Just in case ASIC says we need you to acknowledge on a second platform what you spoke about. We need your client to figure out what was going on. Yeah, that that is a whole... I mean, first of all, congratulations. Well done. Um, I love the way that you've tackled this FASIA problem um, sort of head on. You've said, okay... This is the world in which we live. Um, I'm just going to make it as streamlined, efficient, effective, Mm. and enjoyable for my client as much as possible. And I I think that's a really, really awesome sort of frame to to tackle this with. Um, And in terms of getting, and I've never actually thought of this, but the ability for a client to view the file notes that are on them, that is, I mean, that is a fantastic piece of, I guess, transparency for, for the client because 
there's probably going to be 25% of clients, you know, if you think of the HVDI sort of personality test, you, you're going to get 25% of clients that are going to be really interested in that anyway. Um, and, 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 and they're probably going to have the ability to sort of say yes or no, or, you know, and I'd imagine probably majority of the time would be yes. Um, but the fact that you can achieve sort of highly compliant and efficient advice in this new overly, not overly regulated, but just the new uh, regulated regime is fantastic. Um, so, yeah, man, you should, you, and I guess how the question is, how are your clients responding to this? It, it needs a little bit of hand-holding, which is understandable. It's completely new. Um, we have no problem with the Gen Y and kind of Gen X. The, the issue comes, we've got one client who's 96. <laughs> She's never buy of it. Uh, majority of them, even the, the sort of quote-unquote oldies, 65 to say 80, are fine. They have to get a, a email and whatnot for MyGov anyway. Centrelink is pushing them that way. So they log on. The majority of their call, they say, I forgot my password. And I say, obviously, I don't know your password. I'm guessing it's something along the lines of blah, blah, blah. And they go, yeah, 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 whatever. And so we can just resetting password super easy. And we've just given a bunch of loan videos and step by step. Um, oh, sorry, before, before we sort of stop, the, the, the portal, of course, we upload the statement. So any advice document goes in there and it's got bloody bells on it. Clayton, this is your statement. Bang. And so they just run through it. It's becoming incredibly efficient. So the, the case study that I wanted to sort of bring to your attention to answer your question. Lovely couple went from here to WA in the middle of nowhere. Um, tire blew up, car did something, something else. Very inconvenient. Uh, she said I need five grand. She's fine, you know, so we validated her. She was, same number, all that jazz. And I said, how do you want it? And she said, well, look, you can't email it because we're, you know, in the middle of nowhere. Uh, can't post it because we're not going to be here by the time it gets here. And I thought, this is where the portal. So all we did is jumped up what we call it execution only. You know, I want five grand paid to my account. And then a product form. Bang, bang. It was there in two minutes. She logs on, submits her PIN. Bang, bang. Sends me an email. You know, you're right to process this withdrawal. So I call about two seconds later, like realistically call about 20 minutes later. She's all done. I reckon it's probably going to be in your account by three. Damn, man. The, the, the scenarios, and I've, I've always, like, I'm just that pesty kid that keeps sending them out to <laughs> everyone who doesn't care. I'm like, ah, I know you don't care, so you're getting another one. Um, but I've done 15 of these scenarios. Easy. And it's just such a big problem so because we were finding as well being rural-based, we've got clients in Mackay, we've got clients in Tali where nobody knows where that is, clients in Tassie. Um, and even getting things that like we have, like every advice firm has, dates. So things need to be done by June or July or whatever. And if I need to post stuff to them, it's not going to happen. If you're encroaching on that 65 mark and you need to be making contributions and can't, how do I do it faster? Mm. And, and this solves all that because we had one lady in Tully, same thing, had to do this, 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 this. The most complicated piece of advice I think I've ever done Recontribution, you name it, application to super assets. And I think she had to do 26 pins or 27 pins or something like that. But it got done on in a 25 minute span. My email just blew up. Boom, 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 boom. And we said, Bob's your uncle, right to go. So if that didn't happen, her retirement experience, don't get me wrong, you know, she sort of came to us last minute, but would be significantly different. Huh. Man, that's what, what level of okay so you're with in focus and the interesting thing i find about in focus <laughs> is they have their own software and then mm -hmm. i assume that the software and the compliance team work hand in hand quite succinctly and i i i would i would imagine it would have an advantage do you think that piece of software plays a huge role in being able to do that or do you think you could replicate what you're doing externally with another piece of software we, uh, I'm just very, very conscious that people from Infocus will be watching this. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're still allowed to give your honest opinion. They give, um, they, they call it Platform Plus, and Platform Plus is this amazing beast that sits in the corner that nobody really knows what it can do. And to be frank, I can't take any of this credit because it was all Colleen that designed it um, and, and asked those questions and said, hey, why, why can't this be done by this? In theory, a lot of the other things could be done by other, but you, you couldn't do the digital, you couldn't do the 
portal, you have to sort of back that up. And the good thing about Platform Plus is that they've already got their IP and all their insurances in place and they've got a big, bad server that makes sure this, because, you know, we've got high-level medical professionals and whatnot, and they don't want that stuff getting out. Not that there's a hierarchy. Yeah. Even mums and nobody wants their stuff getting out. Yes. Um, so I think, in theory, it would be really, really difficult to replicate. But also, and I'm taking the credit for this as well, so <laughs> anyone can suck it. Um, <laughs> It wouldn't have been what it is without our constant pestering and involvement. Yeah, cool. No, I've I've got no doubt. It's it's <clears> been an interesting thing when people ask me about you know licensees. I always do mention like because of how much advice is dependent upon compliance these days. It does make a lot of sense to have a licensee thoroughly involved in the statement of advice process. So there's a, there's an advantage there. And then I guess the only question is, can other licensees replicate what's, what um, Infocus and Platform Plus can do with other pieces of technology? Who knows? I'm certainly no expert, um, but that's kind of, it sort of stands out to me as an advantage. Uh, one of the things that I also respect about what you do, Ben, is um, you really practice what you preach in terms of being um, you know, financially diligent with your own money uh, making decisions and your, and your own ability to sort of budget. Mm -hmm. and, and even though, you know, I think you were maybe 25 when we met, which would put you at sort of like, you know, early to mid thirties now, um, sort of I've seen how responsible that you have been during this whole process of, of building your own business and purchasing properties and and really just sort of you know locking away cash <clears throat> squirreling away i think they call it what sort of effect becoming a financial planner do you think has this had on your own personal um, money management and what what's your view on sort of you know being a successful something for your clients to want to admire and, 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 you know, mirror, I guess, your own success. And, and, and how much of that do you talk about when you talk to your clients? You know, do you talk about what you've done yourself as a part of your financial planning process? Definitely has been taken into consideration. If you look at any self-employed business, the last person that they think about is themselves. Like I've got a buddy in New Zealand and he teaches dance to school. And we all ridiculed him at school, didn't we? Because he was the idiot. <laughs> And now he goes, literally goes around New Zealand teaching kids to dance because it helps with their confidence and their, you, you name it. And he got, I'm not sure if it's an award or an accolade or just <laughs> whatever, um, but of the 360 odd days in last year, he was using Airbnb for like 340 of them. Whoa. And so he's making big coin, but he's spending big coin. I just happened to say to me that I'm like, what are you, what are you doing? And he's like, I've not thought about, I don't even look at, and it's one of the biggest bugaboos that I have to keep grinding because I'm so far behind. Like I've done nothing for me in five years or whatever. And I, I, it's, that became awfully evident with financial planning. And also with, you know, the profit used to be like this and now it's sort of like this. And what I managed to do, and I think this is a big statement and I stand by it. And one of the things I learned from the masters is that if you're going to make a rash decision, you have to keep it and argue it. Um, <laughs> And for any of you that follow Clayton in his earlier years, you'd sort of understand where this concept came from. But I think property is too expensive now as a general rule, but more importantly with property, it locks you into whatever occupation that you're doing. So that we've got a bloke up here and he's a high level surgeon, which is basically just sort of political nonsense where he's a really <laughs> painful person. Um, <laughs> And he'll constantly bring it up in conversations like, I haven't got time for this. I've got $4 million mortgage. And you're like, hmm, don't care, don't care. It's your fault. <laughs> but I found myself doing that as well. And I thought years and years and years ago, and it sort of helps that I'm in Bundaberg with the median house prices significantly less than Brisbane and Sydney and all that. How do I replace the notion of conventional employment with passive income? In order to do what I want to do, because we've all been that 20-year-old and that 25-year-old that maybe white lies a lot of the stories and I sort of thought you have to be accountable to yourself so you can say whatever the hell you want but when you go home and look in the mirror you've got to realize you've got to be comfy with that bloke and I thought if I'm busting my guts out here charging fees and whatnot 
and I aren't, I'm not sustainable. I, like, what's the point? I'm just giving these people advice and then realistically I'm going to end up on, you know, a bank when banks were employing three years ago. So what we managed, what I managed to do was, and it was a really interesting concept. When I bought my first house, I didn't realize that the bank actually took the deposit for some reason. I ironically had a financial planning background, but <laughs> so 84 odd grand disappeared and I thought, huh, <laughs> I'm sitting in this brand new house with like a swag and a, a computer screen for a TV. Um, but what we managed to do was buy houses, super cheap, spend a bit of money on them, paint, carpet, you know, just little things, and then put second houses on the backs. And in Bundaberg, I can do that for 200 grand. So the house and a quarter acre, second house for 160. We've done that a few times now. And so most of the houses will spit out roughly 34-ish, 35 grand, give or take. Wow. So if you take, you know, the argument with that is that there's a huge increase in capital from the get-go because it's a second house. There's some tax benefits there. You get depreciation, you get deductibility, you get, you know, rates, all that sort of jazz. More importantly, it's hugely financially positive. Like, so the cash flow, most of them are spitting out 10, 15 after loans. Wow. So the argument now is when I'm talking to clients, when I come to work, my mindset says, you don't have to be here. Not that that should sound... I don't want everyone to think I'm cocky. I've been in the foxhole for eight years now, so I'm confident because I'm relying on this horse. Yes. Um, so I, I come to work because I want to. And when things like fascia and the exams and the masters, which is going to sting most people, 30 or 40 grand, come in and you've got a couple of kids or you're time poor or you're thinking about retiring, but how are you supposed to find that sort of money? So we changed the ideology between work to want now because there's such a, a you know it, it's just it took a while don't get me wrong I'm summarizing this but yeah it's such a big shift in perspective so when clients come in and they've got issues it's go on mate bring it in we can deal with it it's no it's no drama yeah that's a really good story um because yeah you mentioned earlier when uh, when i met you you were a uh a kickboxer <laughs> and uh and, and I'd sort of come from uh, tax accounting and a little bit of a uh, year of power planning. And, um, but I still had a lot to learn myself. But I remember thinking, wow, you know, like at least, I, at least my last job wasn't, you know, clocking people with elbows. Coincidentally, I learned the other day that when, uh, when you strike with an elbow to not clench your fist, because if you clench your fist, you're softening up the uh, the piece of the elbow that you actually want to and so to keep the the hand open has uh, creates more of a, a brutal impact. What were, by you and doing, by. what were you doing yesterday? Did that just pop up on? <laughs> no 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 no. Because uh, the Conor McGregor fight where you strike <laughs> the, the shoulder strikes and then so I was like okay well <clears throat> how yeah anyway so I end up looking into uh, to elbow strikes. <laughs> <laughs> sort of a a side side note there. Um, so what's the plans, man? Like, obviously you, you're in your early thirties, you, you're setting yourself up for the future. What, what do you see as the future of advice? What does it look like? What are you changing? How are you staying up to date beyond efficiencies and effectiveness and compliance? Like where is your head at and what are the next steps that you're taking? I really like, and you know, just again, back to the caveat, not trying to annoy other people, but I really like the inclusion of the education. You know, historically, a, a diplomas and advanced diplomas were a bit of a joke. I think I did an advanced diploma over a weekend that I found on Groupon because I needed CPD points. Oh, Jesus. And it was, it was an absolute joke. Um, and I've just finished the master's. And so that's uh, the conventional education is what will teach you something. And then in six months, we're going to ask you what we taught you. And the masters is like, we don't know what you're going to respond with, dude. We want you to make sure that you know this so well, you can have a position and think about stuff that we haven't even considered. And you're like, right. So when I got my research project back, they said, you actually want to, like, this isn't just a mark. You really want to push this. I'd be applying for unis for your PhD and I'd be looking for scholarships and I'd be doing this, not just, you know, oh, you got you got to credit, whatever, off you go. So we sort of started investigating that. And I think it's going to be a bit of a game changer. But now, when we were growing up, the aim was to have as many policies as possible, um, as little overheads as possible, and basically unofficially, of course, and some of you are going to not like this, but never return phone calls. I mean, why would you? 
<laughs> so now it's just shifted. Yeah. So now I think uh, we'd, we'd have about 160 ongoing clients. And that's fee for service. I think we've got like two grandfather policies, which um, annoy me. And then we'd have, I don't know, 20 or 30 policies of risk. And most of them, we just send them an email every couple of years or every year and say, hey, has anything changed? We need to chat. If not, sweet it. So I think the notion is going to change from being all of this and doing nothing mm. to doing all of this and doing everything. And every advisor is going to get to a certain, depending on their support staff, very similar to a CPA arrangement, every advisor is going to get to a number where realistically you can't service more than 100, 150, 200 clients. Yeah. And, do it. and even 200 is pushing it. That's big numbers. And especially with some of these assets coming out. So the conversation we had this morning was if people are consistently taking money out, can we cancel the arrangement before the tenure on the basis that advice isn't just, you know, if they're going from 100 and they're old and their aim is to spend all their money, how about we just... And they said, yeah, yeah, but if you're not doing a review, you've got to give back all the money. I said, yeah, right. Off. So my response was then, would you like me to do a review on an investment account that's got $15 in it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And like, right, I get it. That's a bad scenario, but there's got to be some. So I think we're going to be- become really particular about who we're taking on now. Yeah. And then there's going to be some mutual agreement when we get to the CSA, we've done this, we've done that. We say, hey, guys, we, we just don't need you. And you just don't need us. We're still here. Pick up the phone, but... We're just not going to charge you. Just re-engage us when you're ready. So I think the model's going to change and we're going to see a lot of small businesses having two or three ARs, capped amount of clients, you know, and it's going to factor in things like Ben doesn't want to work Fridays. Ben wants to play his guitar. Jess wants to have a baby. Um, so she doesn't want to work Tuesdays. And there's going to be this, this massive shift of when we first started, we did everything for them straight away. Whereas realistically now, the website tells everyone that I don't work Friday afternoons and that's okay because mm. we've still got enough margin and profit to remain sustainable and we just need to allocate our time now. So my calendar sort of looks like return phone calls, study, whatever else, keep up on the current affairs. And so we used to come to work and go, right, I don't know what to do. Yeah. So it's just going to become a bit more structured. Yeah. And also um, it's the last thing about that, and I'm very, very guilty of sort of this type of mindset is when we first started, there seemed to be some sort of internal hierarchy or I thought sometimes I was better than other people and vice versa, but I didn't really understand the situation. So like you'd get a guy in town and he'd say, Oh, this guy's stuffed me over. This is the advice that I got. And I was the first to go, that's crap. But I had no idea about, and I'm sort of use that for my own growth now, but now when we're getting clients and it's happened a lot this year, people say, Oh, you know, I'm sick of this bloke. And you sort of say, why? What, what's he done? Oh, his super doesn't, my super hasn't grown. Like, where are you? What are you doing? What are you, if it's in an index fund and you're not putting any money in, this is just changing their expectations. Yeah, I, I kind of like that. So rather than rather than just assuming that the client is, has a, a valid reason to not like the advice that they've received is actually maybe even challenging them as to what what the problem is and and potentially there's not a problem beyond you know just however the market is performed mm. yeah man that's a really good insight um now with respect to the fact that not everyone has access to platform plus um i'll uh, i'll make sure that if you want to share that loom video that you sent across we can put a link in the description um if that's the kind of thing that you that you want to share with everyone. Alternatively, you know, if someone wanted to reach out and say, hey, what's the best way, you know, let people know what's going on. So what are we, we're at uh, Ben at Nielsen Wealth, N-E-I-L-S-O-N, and then Wealth, W-E-A-L-T-H, dot com, dot A-U. 0481-343-975. Call the office, send a link, like just do stuff. Because sometimes I think, I've got a quote here from um, Hemingway that I was hoping you'd let me bring up. Um, <laughs> Go, please. And I'm not trying to be sexist, but this is just Hemingway because, I mean, he was. A man without direction will always return to his former self. And I just think sometimes that a lot of the people that we're dealing with, they're getting sensory overload. They've changed everything. The advisors are used to doing this and now you can't do this. And they go, oh, bugger it, you know. Bugger it, bugger it. And that they're experiencing sensory overload. And a lot of these people don't know what it is. And so even if you're just bored, man, just call and just make sure that some of the most meaningful conversations I've had in the last 12 months is when they said, oh, it's going on. They go, I feel a little bit bloody bland. And you're like, you're allowed to. That's fine. 
yeah but, you know but let's investigate that because you're going through he's going through we're going through we've got a little solution but if we're talking about stuff then we can find a practical way to tackle it but i just i kind of think that all advisors whether you me you name them they're all doing advice i'm not quite sure why we're not going this is what we do how do you guys do it because yeah. you're doing something faster than what we're doing and if we can make it easier and quicker and more effective why is it hidden no a hundred percent yeah that's been you know as you know one of the core tenants of mm. xy since it began if we can lift all the boats you know rise the tide all boats rise it's um it's the best way to my mind and thankfully to oh, thousands of other advisors that the best way to for everyone to get better is less top down uh, forcing regulation and more sharing amongst each other, this collegiate peer to peer learning. And yeah, man, um, it's, it's awesome. I really do appreciate you coming on sharing with us. And uh, it's been really cool to watch how you've sort of pulled it all together over the last few years, man. And, um, take my hat off to you. So thank you so much for coming on. Matt, I'm super humbled for the introduction and the, the opportunity. So thank you. Cheers, man. Thanks again. <laughs> <laughs>